Book 3, of Words, Chapter 6, of the Names of Substances, 1. The common names of substances stand for thoughts. The common names of substances, as well as other general terms, stand for thoughts, which is nothing else but the being made signs of such complex ideas wherein several particular substances do or might agree, by virtue of which they are capable of being comprehended in one common conception and signified by one name, I say do or might agree, for though there be but one sun existing in the world, yet the idea of it being abstracted, so that more substances, if there were several, might each agree in it, it is as much a sort as if there were as many suns as there are stars. They want not their reasons who think there are, and that each fixed star would answer the idea the name sun stands for, to one who was placed in a due distance, which, by the way, may show us how much the sorts, or, if you please, genera and species of things, for those Latin terms signify to me no more than the English word sort, depend on such collections of ideas as men have made, and not on the real nature of things, since it is not impossible but that, in propriety of speech, that might be a sun to one which is a star to another. 2. The essence of each sort of substance is our abstract idea to which the name is annexed. The measure and boundary of each sort or species, whereby it is constituted that particular sort, and distinguished from others, is that we call its essence, which is nothing but that abstract idea to which the name is annexed, so that everything contained in that idea is essential to that sort. This though it be all the essence of natural substances that we know, or by which we distinguish them into sorts, yet I call it by a peculiar name, the nominal essence, to distinguish it from the real constitution of substances, upon which depends this nominal essence, and all the properties of that sort, which, therefore, as has been said, may be called the real essence, vg the nominal essence of gold is that complex idea the word gold stands for, let it be, for instance, a body yellow, of a certain weight, malleable, fusible, and fixed. But the real essence is the constitution of the insensible parts of that body, on which those qualities and all the other properties of gold depend. How far these two are different, though they are both called essence, is obvious at first sight to discover. 3. The nominal and real essence different, for, though perhaps voluntary motion, with sense and reason, joined to a body of a certain shape, be the complex idea to which I and others annex the name man, and so be the nominal essence of the species so called, yet nobody will say that complex idea is the real essence and source of all those operations which are to be found in any individual of that sort. The foundation of all those qualities which are the ingredients of our complex idea, is something quite different and had we such a knowledge of that constitution of man, from which his faculties of moving, sensation, and reasoning, and other powers flow, and on which his so regular shape depends, as it is possible angels have, and it is certain his maker has, we should have a quite other idea of his essence than what now is contained in our definition of that species, be it what it will and our idea of any individual man would be as far different from what it is now, as is his who knows all the springs and wheels and other contrivances within of the famous clock at Strasbourg, from that which a gazing countryman has of it, who barely sees the motion of the hand, and hears the clock strike, and observes only some of the outward appearances. For nothing essential to individuals, that essence, in the ordinary use of the word, relates to sorts and that it is considered in particular beings no further than as they are ranked into sorts, appears from hence, that, take but away the abstract ideas by which we sort individuals, and rank them under common names, and then the thought of anything essential to any of them instantly vanishes, we have no notion of the one without the other, which plainly shows their relation. It is necessary for me to be as I am. God and nature has made me so, but there is nothing I have is essential to me. An accident or disease may very much alter my color or shape, a fever or fall may take away my reason or memory, or both, and an apoplexy leave neither sense, nor understanding, no, nor life. Other creatures of my shape may be made with more and better, or fewer and worse faculties than I have, 
and others may have reason and sense in a shape and body very different from mine. None of these are essential to the one or the other, or to any individual whatever, till the mind refers it to some sort or species of things, and then presently, according to the abstract idea of that sort, something is found essential. Let anyone examine his own thoughts, and he will find that as soon as he supposes or speaks of essential, the consideration of some species, or the complex idea signified by some general name, comes into his mind, and it is in reference to that that this or that quality is said to be essential, so that if it be asked, whether it be essential to me or any other particular corporeal being, to have reason, I say, no, no more than it is essential to this white thing I write on to have words in it, but if that particular being be to be counted of the sort man, and to have the name man given it, then reason is essential to it, supposing reason to be a part of the complex idea the name man stands for, as it is essential to this thing I write on to contain words, if I will give it the name treatise, and rank it under that species, so that essential and not essential relate only to our abstract ideas, and the names annexed to them, which amounts to no more than this, that whatever particular thing has not in it those qualities which are contained in the abstract idea which any general term stands for, cannot be ranked under that species, nor be called by that name, since that abstract idea is the very essence of that species. 5. The only essences perceived by us in individual substances are those qualities which entitle them to receive their names, thus, if the idea of body with some people be bare extension or space, then solidity is not essential to body, if others make the idea to which they give the name body to be solidity and extension, then solidity is essential to body. That therefore, and that alone, is considered as essential, which makes a part of the complex idea the name of a sort stands for, without which no particular thing can be reckoned of that sort nor be entitled to that name. Should there be found a parcel of matter that had all the other qualities that are in iron, but wanted obedience to the lodestone, and would neither be drawn by it nor receive direction from it, would any one question whether it wanted anything essential? It would be absurd to ask, whether a thing really existing wanted anything essential to it, or could it be demanded, whether this made an essential or specific difference or no? since we have no other measure of essential or specific but our abstract ideas, and to talk of specific differences in nature, without reference to general ideas and names, is to talk unintelligibly, for I would ask anyone, what is sufficient to make an essential difference in nature between any two particular beings, without any regard had to some abstract idea which is looked upon as the essence and standard of a species. All such patterns and standards being quite laid aside, particular beings, considered barely in themselves, will be found to have all their qualities equally essential, and everything in each individual will be essential to it, or, which is more, nothing at all. For, though it may be reasonable to ask, whether obeying the magnet be essential to iron, Yet I think it is very improper and insignificant to ask, whether it be essential to the particular parcel of matter I cut my pen with, without considering it under the name iron, or as being of a certain species, and if, as has been said, our abstract ideas, which have names annexed to them, are the boundaries of species, nothing can be essential but what is contained in those ideas. 6. Even the real essences of individual substances imply potential sorts. It is true, I have often mentioned real essence, distinct in substances from those abstract ideas of them, which I call their nominal essence. By this real essence I mean, that real constitution of anything, which is the foundation of all those properties that are combined in and are constantly found to coexist with the nominal essence, that particular constitution which everything has within itself, without any relation to anything without it. But essence, even in this sense, relates to a sort, and supposes a species. For, being that real constitution on which the properties depend, it necessarily supposes a sort of things, properties belonging only to species, and not to individuals, v. g. Supposing the nominal essence of gold to be a body of such a peculiar color and weight, with malleability and fusibility, 
The real essence is that constitution of the parts of matter on which these qualities and their union depend, and is also the foundation of its solubility in aqua regia and other properties, accompanying that complex idea. Here are essences and properties, but all upon supposition of a sort or general abstract idea, which is considered as immutable, but there is no individual parcel of matter to which any of these qualities are so annexed as to be essential to it or inseparable from it. That which is essential belongs to it as a condition whereby it is of this or that sort, but take away the consideration of its being ranked under the name of some abstract idea, and then there is nothing necessary to it, nothing inseparable from it. Indeed, as to the real essences of substances, we only suppose their being, without precisely knowing what they are, but that which annexes them still to the species is the nominal essence, of which they are the supposed foundation and cause. 7. The nominal essence bounds the species to us. The next thing to be considered is, by which of those essences it is that substances are determined into sorts or species, and that, it is evident, is by the nominal essence. For it is that alone that the name, which is the mark of the sort, signifies. It is impossible, therefore, that anything should determine the sorts of things, which we rank under general names, but that idea which that name is designed as a mark for, which is that, as has been shown, which we call nominal essence. Why do we say this is a horse, and that a mule, this is an animal, that an herb? How comes any particular thing to be of this or that sort, but because it has that nominal essence, or, which is all one, agrees to that abstract idea? that name is annexed to, and I desire any one but to reflect on his own thoughts, when he hears or speaks any of those or other names of substances, to know what sort of essences they stand for. 8. The nature of species as formed by us, and that the species of things to us are nothing but the ranking them under distinct names, according to the complex ideas in US, and not according to precise, distinct, real essences in them is plain from hence colon that we find many of the individuals that are ranked into one sort, called by one common name, and so received as being of one species, have yet qualities, depending on their real constitutions, as far different one from another as from others from which they are accounted to differ specifically. This, as it is easy to be observed by all who have to do with natural bodies, so chemists especially are often, by sad experience, convinced of it, when they, sometimes in vain, seek for the same qualities in one parcel of sulphur, antimony, or vitriol, which they have found in others, for, though they are bodies of the same species, having the same nominal essence, under the same name, yet do they often, upon severe ways of examination, betray qualities so different one from another, as to frustrate the expectation and labor of very wary chemists. But if things were distinguished into species, according to their real essences, it would be as impossible to find different properties in any two individual substances of the same species, as it is to find different properties in two circles, or two equilateral triangles. That is properly the essence to us which determines every particular to this or that classes, or, which is the same thing, to this or that general name, and what can that be else, but that abstract idea to which that name is annexed, and so has, in truth, a reference, not so much to the being of particular things, as to their general denominations. 9. Not the real essence, or texture of parts which we know not, nor indeed can we rank and sort things, and consequently, which is the end of sorting, denominate them, by their real essences, because we know them not. Our faculties carry us no further towards the knowledge and distinction of substances, than a collection of those sensible ideas which we observe in them, which, however made with the greatest diligence and exactness we are capable of yet is more remote from the true internal constitution from which those qualities flow, than, as I said, a countryman's idea is from the inward contrivance of that famous clock at Strasbourg, whereof he only sees the outward figure and motions. There is not so contemptible a plant or animal, that does not confound the most enlarged understanding. Though the familiar use of things about us take off our wonder, 
yet it cures not our ignorance, when we come to examine the stones we tread on, or the iron we daily handle, we presently find we know not their make, and can give no reason of the different qualities we find in them. It is evident the internal constitution, whereon their properties depend, is unknown to us, for to go no further than the grossest and most obvious we can imagine amongst them, what is that texture of parts, that real essence, that makes lead and antimony fusible, wood and stones not, what makes lead and iron malleable, antimony and stones not, and yet how infinitely these come short of the fine contrivances and inconceivable real essences of plants or animals, every one knows, the workmanship of the all-wise and powerful God in the great fabric of the universe, and every part thereof, further exceeds the capacity and comprehension of the most inquisitive and intelligent man, than the best contrivance of the most ingenious man doth the conceptions of the most ignorant of rational creatures. Therefore we in vain pretend to range things into sorts, and dispose them into certain classes under names, by their real essences, that are so far from our discovery or comprehension. A blind man may as soon sort things by their colors, and he that has lost his smell as well distinguish a lily and a rose by their odors, as by those internal constitutions which he knows not. He that thinks he can distinguish sheep and goats by their real essences, that are unknown to him, may be pleased to try his skill in those species called cassiwary and Correcinchio, and by their internal real essences determine the boundaries of those species, without knowing the complex idea of sensible qualities that each of those names stand for, in the countries where those animals are to be found. 10. Not the substantial form, which know not. Those, therefore, who have been taught that the several species of substances had their distinct internal substantial forms and that it was those forms which made the distinction of substances into their true species and genera, were led yet further out of the way by having their minds set upon fruitless inquiries after substantial forms, wholly unintelligible, and whereof we have scarce so much as any obscure or confused conception in general. 11. That the nominal essence is that only whereby we distinguish species of substances, further evident, from our ideas of finite spirits and of God, that our ranking and distinguishing natural substances into species consists in the nominal essences the mind makes, and not in the real essences to be found in the things themselves, is further evident from our ideas of spirits. For the mind getting, only by reflecting on its own operations, those simple ideas which it attributes to spirits it hath or can have no other notion of spirit but by attributing all those operations it finds in itself to a sort of beings, without consideration of matter. And even the most advanced notion we have of God is but attributing the same simple ideas which we have got from reflection on what we find in ourselves, and which we conceive to have more perfection in them than would be in their absence, attributing, I say, those simple ideas to him in an unlimited degree. Thus, having got from reflecting on ourselves the idea of existence, knowledge, power and pleasure, each of which we find it better to have than to want, and the more we have of each the better, joining all these together, with infinity to each of them, we have the complex idea of an eternal, omniscient, omnipotent, infinitely wise and happy being, and though we are told that there are different species of angels, yet we know not how to frame distinct specific ideas of them, not out of any conceit that the existence of more species than one of spirits is impossible, but because having no more simple ideas, nor being able to frame more, applicable to such beings, but only those few taken from ourselves, and from the actions of our own minds in thinking, and being delighted, and moving several parts of our bodies, we can no otherwise distinguish in our conceptions the several species of spirits, one from another, but by attributing those operations and powers we find in ourselves to them in a higher or lower degree, and so have no very distinct specific ideas of spirits, except only of God, to whom we attribute both duration and all those other ideas with infinity, to the other spirits, with limitation, nor, as I humbly conceive, do we, between God and them in our ideas, put any difference, by any number of simple ideas which we have of one and not of the other, 
but only that of infinity. All the particular ideas of existence, knowledge, will, power, and motion, etc., being ideas derived from the operations of our minds, we attribute all of them to all sorts of spirits, with the difference only of degrees, to the utmost we can imagine, even infinity, when we would frame as well as we can an idea of the first being, who yet, it is certain, is infinitely more remote, in the real excellency of his nature, from the highest and perfectest of all created beings, than the greatest man, nay, purest seraph, is from the most contemptible part of matter, and consequently must infinitely exceed what our narrow understandings can conceive of him. 12. Of finite spirits there are probably numberless species in a continuous series of gradations. It is not impossible to conceive, nor repugnant to reason, that there may be many species of spirits, as much separated and diversified one from another by distinct properties whereof we have no ideas as the species of sensible things are distinguished one from another by qualities which we know and observe in them. That there should be more species of intelligent creatures above us, than there are of sensible and material below us, is probable to me from hence, that in all the visible corporeal world, we see no chasms or gaps. All quite down from us the descent is by easy steps, and a continued series of things that in each removed if a very little one from the other. There are fishes that have wings, and are not strangers to the airy region, and there are some birds that are inhabitants of the water, whose blood is cold as fishes, and their flesh so like in taste that the scrupulous are allowed them on fish days. There are animals so near of kin both to birds and beasts that they are in the middle between both, amphibious animals link the terrestrial and aquatic together, seals live at land and sea and porpoises have the warm blood and entrails of a hog, not to mention what is confidently reported of mermaids, or seamen, there are some brutes that seem to have as much knowledge and reason as some that are called men, and the animal and vegetable kingdoms are so nearly joined, that, if you will take the lowest of one and the highest of the other, there will scarce be perceived any great difference between them, and so on till we come to the lowest and the most inorganical parts of matter, we shall find everywhere that the several species are linked together, and differ but in almost insensible degrees. And when we consider the infinite power and wisdom of the Maker, we have reason to think that it is suitable to the magnificent harmony of the universe, and the great design and infinite goodness of the architect, that the species of creatures should also, by gentle degrees, ascend upward from us toward his infinite perfection, as we see they gradually descend from us downwards, which if it be probable, we have reason then to be persuaded that there are far more species of creatures above us than there are beneath, we being, in degrees of perfection, much more remote from the infinite being of God than we are from the lowest state of being, and that which approaches nearest to nothing, and yet of all those distinct species, for the reasons above said, we have no clear distinct ideas. 13. The nominal essence that of the species, as conceived by us, proved from water and ice. But to return to the species of corporeal substances. If I should ask any one whether ice and water were two distinct species of things, I doubt not but I should be answered in the affirmative, and it cannot be denied but he that says they are two distinct species is in the right. But if an Englishman bred in Jamaica, who perhaps had never seen nor heard of ice, coming into England in the winter, find the water he put in his basin at night in a great part frozen in the morning, and, not knowing any peculiar name it had, should call it hardened water, I ask whether this would be a new species to him, different from water, and I think it would be answered here, it would not be to him a new species, no more than congealed jelly, when it is cold, is a distinct species from the same jelly fluid and warm, or than liquid gold in the furnace is a distinct species from hard gold in the hands of a workman. And if this be so, it is plain that our distinct species are nothing but distinct complex ideas, with distinct names annexed to them. It is true every substance that exists has its peculiar constitution, whereon depend those sensible qualities and powers we observe in it, but the ranking of things into species, which is nothing but sorting them under several titles, is done by us according to the ideas that we have of them, which, 
though sufficient to distinguish them by names, so that we may be able to discourse of them when we have them not present before us, yet if we suppose it to be done by their real internal constitutions, and that things existing are distinguished by nature into species, by real essences, according as we distinguish them into species by names, we shall be liable to great mistakes. 14. Difficulties in the supposition of a certain number of real essences to distinguish substantial beings into species, according to the usual supposition, that there are certain precise essences or forms of things, whereby all the individuals existing are, by nature distinguished into species, these things are necessary. 15. A crude supposition. First, to be assured that nature, in the production of things, always designs them to partake of certain regulated established essences, which are to be the models of all things to be produced. This, in that crude sense it is usually proposed, would need some better explication, before it can fully be assented to. 16. Monstrous births. Secondly, it would be necessary to know whether nature always attains the essence it designs in the production of things. The irregular and monstrous births, that in divers sorts of animals have been observed, will always give us reason to doubt of one or both of these. 17. Are monsters really a distinct species? Thirdly, it ought to be determined whether those we call monsters be really a distinct species, according to the scholastic notion of the word species, since it is certain that everything that exists has its particular constitution, and yet we find that some of these monstrous productions have few or none of those qualities which are supposed to result from, and accompany, the essence of that species from whence they derive their originals, and to which, by their descent, they seem to belong. 18. Men can have no ideas of real essences. Fourthly, the real essences of those things which we distinguish into species, and as so distinguished we name, ought to be known, that is we ought to have ideas of them. But since we are ignorant in these four points, the supposed real essences of things stand us not instead for the distinguishing substances into species. 19. Our nominal essences of substances not perfect collections of the properties that flow from the real essence. Fifthly, the only imaginable help in this case would be, that, having framed perfect complex ideas of the properties of things flowing from their different real essences, we should thereby distinguish them into species, but neither can this be done, for, being ignorant of the real essence itself, it is impossible to know all those properties that flow from it, and are so annexed to it, that any one of them being away, we may certainly conclude that that essence is not there and so the thing is not of that species. We can never know what is the precise number of properties depending on the real essence of gold, any one of which failing, the real essence of gold, and consequently gold, would not be there, unless we knew the real essence of gold itself, and by that determined that species, by the word gold here, I must be understood to design a particular piece of matter, v. g the last guinea that was coined, for, if it should stand here, in its ordinary signification, for that complex idea which I or anyone else calls gold, I, E, for the nominal essence of gold, it would be jargon. So hard is it to show the various meaning and imperfection of words, when we have nothing else but words to do it by. 20. Hence names independent of real essence, by all which it is clear, that our distinguishing substances into species by names, is not at all founded on their real essences, nor can we pretend to range and determine them exactly into species, according to internal essential differences. 21. But stand for such collections of simple ideas as we have made the name stand for. But since, as has been remarked, we have need of general words, though we know not the real essences of things, all we can do is, to collect such a number of simple ideas as, by examination, we find to be united together in things existing, and thereof to make one complex idea, which, though it be not the real essence of any substance that exists, is yet the specific essence to which our name belongs, and is convertible with it, by which we may at least try the truth of these nominal essences. For example, the be that say that the essence of body is extension, if it be so 
we can never mistake in putting the essence of anything for the thing itself. Let us then in discourse put extension for body, and when we would say that body moves, let us say that extension moves, and see how it will look. He that should say that one extension by impulse moves another extension, would, by the bare expression, sufficiently show the absurdity of such a notion. The essence of anything in respect of us, is the whole complex idea comprehended and marked by that name, and in substances, besides the several distinct simple ideas that make them up, the confused one of substance, or of an unknown support and cause of their union, is always a part, and therefore the essence of body is not bare extension, but an extended solid thing, and so to say, an extended solid thing moves, or impels another, is all one, and as intelligible, as to say, body moves or impels. Likewise, to say that a rational animal is capable of conversation, is all one as to say a man, but no one will say that rationality is capable of conversation, because it makes not the whole essence to which we give the name man. 22. Our abstract ideas are to us the measures of the species we make in instance in that of man. There are creatures in the world that have shapes like ours, but are hairy and want language and reason. There are naturals amongst us that have perfectly our shape, but want reason, and some of them language too. There are creatures, as it is said, sit fides pens author m, but there appears no contradiction that there should be such, that, with language and reason and a shape in other things agreeing with ours, have hairy tails, others where the males have no beards, and others where the females have. If it be asked whether these be all men or no, all of human species? It is plain, the question refers only to the nominal essence, for those of them to whom the definition of the word man, or the complex idea signified by that name, agrees, are men, and the other not. But if the inquiry be made concerning the supposed real essence, and whether the internal constitution and frame of these several creatures be specifically different, it is wholly impossible for us to answer, no part of that going into our specific idea, only we have reason to think, that where the faculties or outward frame so much differs, the internal constitution is not exactly the same, but what difference in the real internal constitution makes a specific difference it is in vain to inquire, whilst our measures of species be, as they are, only our abstract ideas, which we know, and not that internal constitution, which makes no part of them. Shall the difference of hair only on the skin be a mark of a different internal specific constitution between a changeling and a drill, when they agree in shape, and want of reason and speech? And shall not the want of reason and speech be a sign to us of different real constitutions and species between a changeling and a reasonable man? And so of the rest? If we pretend that distinction of species or sorts is fixedly established by the real frame and secret constitutions of things. 23. Species in animals not distinguished by generation. Nor let anyone say, that the power of propagation in animals by the mixture of male and female, and in plants by seeds, keeps the supposed real species distinct and entire, for, granting this to be true. It would help us in the distinction of the species of things no further than the tribes of animals and vegetables. What must we do for the rest? But in those two it is not sufficient, for if history lie not, women have conceived by drills, and what real species, by that measure, such a production will be in nature will be a new question, and we have reason to think this is not impossible, since mules and jumats, the one from the mixture of an ass and a mare the other from the mixture of a bull and a mare, are so frequent in the world. I once saw a creature that was the issue of a cat and a rat, and had the plain marks of both about it, wherein nature appeared to have followed the pattern of neither sort alone, but to have jumbled them both together. To which he that shall add the monstrous productions that are so frequently to be met with in nature, will find it hard, even in the race of animals to determine by the pedigree of what species every animal's issue is, and be at a loss about the real essence, which he thinks certainly conveyed by generation, and has alone a right to the specific name. But further, if the species of animals and plants are to be distinguished only by propagation, must I go to the Indies to see the sire and dam of the one, 
and the plant from which the seed was gathered that produced the other, to know whether this be a tiger or the t. 24, not by substantial forms. Upon the whole matter, it is evident that it is their own collections of sensible qualities that men make the essences of their several sorts of substances, and that their real internal structures are not considered by the greatest part of men in the sorting them. Much less were any substantial forms ever thought on by any but those who have in this one part of the world learned the language of the schools, and yet those ignorant men, who pretend not any insight into the real essences, nor trouble themselves about substantial forms, but are content with knowing things one from another by their sensible qualities, are often better acquainted with their differences can more nicely distinguish them from their uses, and better know what they expect from each, than those learned quick-sighted men, who look so deep into them, and talk so confidently of something more hidden and essential. 25. The specific essences that are common made by men, but supposing that the real essences of substances were discoverable by those that would severely apply themselves to that inquiry, Yet we could not reasonably think that the ranking of things under general names was regulated by those internal real constitutions, or anything else but their obvious appearances, since languages, in all countries, have been established long before sciences, so that they have not been philosophers or logicians, or such who have troubled themselves about forms and essences, that have made the general names that are in use amongst the several nations of men but those more or less comprehensive terms have, for the most part, in all languages, received their birth and signification from ignorant and illiterate people, who sorted and denominated things by those sensible qualities they found in them, thereby to signify them, when absent, to others, whether they had an occasion to mention a sort or a particular thing. 26. Therefore very various and uncertain in the ideas of different men. Since then it is evident that we sort and name substances by their nominal and not by their real essences, the next thing to be considered is how, and by whom these essences come to be made. As to the latter, it is evident they are made by the mind, and not by nature, for were they nature's workmanship, they could not be so various and different in several men as experience tells us they are. For if we will examine it, we shall not find the nominal essence of any one species of substances in all men the same, no, not of that which of all others we are the most intimately acquainted with. It could not possibly be that the abstract idea to which the name man is given should be different in several men, if it were of nature's making, and that to one it should be animal rationale, and to another animal implume bipes latus ungibus. He that annexes the name man to a complex idea, made up of sense and spontaneous motion, joined to a body of such a shape, has thereby one essence of the species man, and he that, upon further examination, adds rationality, has another essence of the species he calls man, by which means the same individual will be a true man to the one which is not so to the other. I think there is scarce anyone will allow this upright figure, so well known, to be the essential difference of the species man, and yet how far men determine of the sorts of animals rather by their shape than descent, is very visible, since it has been more than once debated, whether several human fetuses should be preserved or received to baptism or no only because of the difference of their outward configuration from the ordinary make of children, without knowing whether they were not as capable of reason as infants cast in another mould, some whereof, though of an approved shape, are never capable of as much appearance of reason all their lives as is to be found in an ape, or an elephant, and never give any signs of being acted by a rational soul, whereby it is evident, that the outward figure, which only was found wanting, and not the faculty of reason, which nobody could know would be wanting in its due season, was made essential to the human species. The learned divine and lawyer must, on such occasions, renounce his sacred definition of animal rationale, and substitute some other essence of the human species. Monsieur Ménage furnishes us with an example worth the taking notice of on this occasion, when the abbot of St. Martin, says he, was born. He had so little of the figure of a man, that it bespake him rather a monster. It was for some time under deliberation, whether he should be baptized or number. However, he was baptized, 
and declared a man provisionally, till time should show what he would prove. Nature had molded him so untowardly, that he was called all his life the abbot Melitru, that is ill-shaped. He was of Kn, Manajana, 278, 430. This child, we see, was very near being excluded out of the species of man, barely by his shape. He escaped very narrowly as he was, and it is certain, a figure a little more oddly turned had cast him, and he had been executed, as a thing not to be allowed to pass for a man. And yet there can be no reason given why, if the lineaments of his face had been a little altered, a rational soul could not have been lodged in him, why a visage somewhat longer, or a nose flatter, or a wider mouth, could not have consisted, as well as the rest of his ill figure, with such a soul, such parts, as made him, disfigured as he was capable to be a dignitary in the church. 27. Nominal essences of particular substances are undetermined by nature, and therefore various as men vary. Wherein, then, would I gladly know, consist the precise and unmovable boundaries of that species. It is plain, if we examine, there is no such thing made by nature, and established by her amongst men. The real essence of that or any other sort of substances, it is evident we know not, and therefore are so undetermined in our nominal essences, which we make ourselves, that, if several men were to be asked concerning some oddly shaped fetus, as soon as born, whether it were a man or no, it is past doubt one should meet with different answers, which could not happen, if the nominal essences, whereby we limit and distinguish the species of substances, were not made by man with some liberty but were exactly copied from precise boundaries set by nature, whereby it distinguished all substances into certain species, who would undertake to resolve what species that monster was of which is mentioned by Lystus, Lib. I. C. 3, with a man's head and hog's body, or those other which to the bodies of men had the heads of beasts, as dogs, horses, etc. If any of these creatures had lived, and could have spoke, it would have increased the difficulty. Had the upper part to the middle been of human shape, and all below swine, had it been murder to destroy it, or must the bishop have been consulted, whether it were man enough to be admitted to the font or no? As I have been told it happened in France some years since, in somewhat a like case. So uncertain are the boundaries of species of animals to us, who have no other measures than the complex ideas of our own collecting, and so far are we from certainly knowing what a man is, though perhaps it will be judged great ignorance to make any doubt about it. And yet I think I may say, that the certain boundaries of that species are so far from being determined, and the precise number of simple ideas which make the nominal essence so far from being settled and perfectly known, that very material doubts may still arise about it. And I imagine none of the definitions of the word man which we yet have, nor descriptions of that sort of animal, are so perfect and exact as to satisfy a considerate inquisitive person, much less to obtain a general consent, and to be that which men would everywhere stick by, in the decision of cases, and determining of life and death, baptism or no baptism, in productions that might happen. 28. But not so arbitrary as mixed modes. But though these nominal essences of substances are made by the mind, they are not yet made so arbitrarily as those of mixed modes. To the making of any nominal essence, it is necessary, first, that the ideas whereof it consists have such a union as to make but one idea, how compounded soever. Secondly, that the particular ideas so united be exactly the same, neither more nor less. For if two abstract complex ideas differ either in number or sorts of their component parts, they make two different and not one and the same essence. In the first of these, the mind, in making its complex ideas of substances, only follows nature, and puts none together which are not supposed to have a union in nature. Nobody joins the voice of a sheep with the shape of a horse, nor the color of lead with the weight and fixedness of gold, to be the complex ideas of any real substances, unless he has a mind to fill his head with chimeras, and his discourse with unintelligible words. Men observing certain qualities always joined and existing together, therein copied nature, 
and of ideas so united made their complex ones of substances. For, though men may make what complex ideas they please, and give what names to them they will, yet, if they will be understood when they speak of things really existing, they must in some degree conform their ideas to the things they would speak of, or else men's language will be like that of Babel, and every man's words, being intelligible only to himself, would no longer serve to conversation and the ordinary affairs of life, if the ideas they stand for be not some way answering the common appearances and agreement of substances as they really exist. 29. Our nominal essences of substances usually consist of a few obvious qualities observed in things. Secondly, though the mind of man, in making its complex ideas of substances, never puts any together that do not really, or are not supposed to, coexist and so it truly borrows that union from nature, yet the number it combines depends upon the various care, industry, or fancy of him that makes it. Men generally content themselves with some few sensible obvious qualities, and often, if not always, leave out others as material and as firmly united as those that they take. Of sensible substances there are two sorts, one of organized bodies, which are propagated by seed, and in these the shape is that which to us is the leading quality, and most characteristical part, that determines the species, and therefore in vegetables and animals, an extended solid substance of such a certain figure usually serves the turn, for however some men seem to prize their definition of animal rationale, yet should there a creature be found that had language and reason, but partake not of the usual shape of man, I believe it would hardly pass for a man how much soever it were animal rationale, and if Balaam's ass had all his life discoursed as rationally as he did once with his master, I doubt yet whether anyone would have thought him worthy the name man, or allowed him to be of the same species with himself, as in vegetables and animals it is the shape, so in most other bodies, not propagated by seed, it is the color we most fix on, and are most led by, thus where we find the color of gold we are apt to imagine all the other qualities comprehended in our complex idea to be there also, and we commonly take these two obvious qualities, viz. shape and color, for so presumptive ideas of several species, that in a good picture, we readily say, this is a lion, and that a rose, this is a gold, and that a silver goblet, only by the different figures and colors represented to the eye by the pencil. 30. Yet, imperfect as they thus are, they serve for common converse, but though this serves well enough for gross and confused conceptions, and inaccurate ways of talking and thinking, yet men are far enough from having agreed on the precise number of simple ideas or qualities belonging to any sort of things, signified by its name, nor is it a wonder, since it requires much time, pains, and skill, strict inquiry, and long examination to find out what, and how many, those simple ideas are, which are constantly and inseparably united in nature, and are always to be found together in the same subject. Most men, wanting either time, inclination, or industry enough for this, even to some tolerable degree, content themselves with some few obvious and outward appearances of things, thereby readily to distinguish and sort them for the common affairs of life, and so, without further examination, give them names, or take up the names already in use, which, though in common conversation they pass well enough for the signs of some few obvious qualities coexisting, are yet far enough from comprehending, in a settled signification, a precise number of simple ideas, much less all those which are united in nature. He that shall consider, after so much stir about genus and species, and such a deal of talk of specific differences, how few words we have yet settled definitions of, may with reason imagine, that those forms which there hath been so much noise made about are only chimeras, which give us no light into the specific natures of things. And he that shall consider how far the names of substances are from having significations wherein all who use them do agree, will have reason to conclude that, though the nominal essences of substances are all supposed to be copied from nature, yet they are all or most of them, very imperfect, since the composition of those complex ideas are, in several men, very different, 
and therefore that these boundaries of species are as men, and not as nature, makes them, if at least there are in nature any such prefixed bounds. It is true that many particular substances are so made by nature, that they have agreement and likeness one with another, and so afford a foundation of being ranked into sorts. But the sorting of things by us, or the making of determinate species, being in order to naming and comprehending them under general terms, I cannot see how it can be properly said, that nature sets the boundaries of the species of things, or, if it be so, our boundaries of species are not exactly conformable to those in nature. For we, having need of general names for present use, stay not for a perfect discovery of all those qualities which would best show us their most material differences and agreements but we ourselves divide them, by certain obvious appearances, into species, that we may the easier under general names communicate our thoughts about them, for, having no other knowledge of any substance but of the simple ideas that are united in it, and observing several particular things to agree with others in several of those simple ideas, we make that collection our specific idea, and give it a general name, that in recording our thoughts, and in our discourse with others, we may in one short word designate all the individuals that agree in that complex idea, without enumerating the simple ideas that make it up, and so not waste our time and breath in tedious descriptions, which we see they are fain to do who would discourse of any new sort of things they have not yet a name for. 31. Essences of species under the same name very different in different minds. But however these species of substances pass well enough in ordinary conversation, it is plain that this complex idea wherein they observe several individuals to agree, is by different men made very differently, by some more, and others less accurately. In some, this complex idea contains a greater, and in others a smaller number of qualities, and so is apparently such as the mind makes it. The yellow shining color makes gold to children, others add weight, malleableness, and fusibility, and others yet other qualities, which they find joined with that yellow color, as constantly as its weight and fusibility. For in all these and the like qualities, one has as good a right to be put into the complex idea of that substance wherein they are all joined as another, and therefore different men, leaving out or putting in several simple ideas which others do not, according to their various examination, skill, or observation of that subject, have different essences of gold, which must therefore be of their own and not of nature's making. 32. The more general our ideas of substances are, the more incomplete and partial they are. If the number of simple ideas that make the nominal essence of the lowest species, or first sorting, of individuals, depends on the mind of man, variously collecting them, it is much more evident that they do so in the more comprehensive classes, which, by the masters of logic, are called genera. These are complex ideas designedly imperfect, and it is visible at first sight that several of those qualities that are to be found in the things themselves are purposely left out of generical ideas, for, as the mind, to make general ideas comprehending several particulars, leaves out those of time and place, and such other, that make them incommunicable to more than one individual, so to make other yet more general ideas, that may comprehend different sorts, it leaves out those qualities that distinguish them and puts into its new collection only such ideas as are common to several sorts. The same convenience that made men express several parcels of yellow matter coming from Guinea and Peru under one name, sets them also upon making of one name that may comprehend both gold and silver, and some other bodies of different sorts. This is done by leaving out those qualities, which are peculiar to each sort and retaining a complex idea made up of those that are common to them all, to which the name metal being annexed, there is a genus constituted, the essence whereof being that abstract idea, containing only malleableness and fusibility, with certain degrees of weight and fixedness, wherein some bodies of several kinds agree, leaves out the color and other qualities peculiar to gold and silver and the other sorts comprehended under the name metal, whereby it is plain that men follow not exactly the patterns set them by nature, when they make their general ideas of substances, since there is no body to be found which has barely malleableness and fusibility in it, 
without other qualities as inseparable as those. But men, in making their general ideas, seeking more the convenience of language, and quick dispatch by short and comprehensive signs, than the true and precise nature of things as they exist, have, in the framing their abstract ideas, chiefly pursued that end, which was to be furnished with store of general and variously comprehensive names. So that in this whole business of genera and species, the genus, or more comprehensive, is but a partial conception of what is in the species, and the species but a partial idea of what is to be found in each individual. If therefore any one will think that a man, and a horse, and an animal, and a plant, etc., are distinguished by real essences made by nature, he must think nature to be very liberal of these real essences, making one for body, another for an animal, and another for a horse and all these essences liberally bestowed upon Bucephalus. But if we would rightly consider what is done in all these genera and species, or sorts, we should find that there is no new thing made, but only more or less comprehensive signs, whereby we may be enabled to express in a few syllables great numbers of particular things, as they agree in more or less general conceptions, which we have framed to that purpose. In all which we may observe, that the more general term is always the name of a less complex idea, and that each genus is but a partial conception of, the species comprehended under it. So that if these abstract general ideas be thought to be complete, it can only be in respect of a certain established relation between them and certain names which are made use of to signify them, and not in respect of anything existing, as made by nature. 33. This all accommodated to the end of the speech. This is adjusted to the true end of speech, which is to be the easiest and shortest way of communicating our notions. For thus he that would discourse of things, as they agreed in the complex idea of extension and solidity, needed but use the word body to denote all such. He that to these would join others, signified by the words life, sense, and spontaneous motion needed but use the word animal to signify all which partaked of those ideas, and he that had made a complex idea of a body, with life, sense, and motion, with the faculty of reasoning, and a certain shape joined to it, needed but use the short monosyllable man, to express all particulars that correspond to that complex idea. This is the proper business of genus and species, and this men do without any consideration of real essences, or substantial forms, which come not within the reach of our knowledge when we think of those things, nor within the signification of our words when we discourse with others. 34. Instance in cassowaries. Were I to talk with any one of a sort of birds I lately saw in street, James's Park, about three or four feet high, with a covering of something between feathers and hair, of a dark brown color, without wings but in the place thereof two or three little branches coming down like sprigs of Spanish broom, long great legs, with feet only of three claws, and without a tail, I must make this description of it, and so may make others understand me. But when I am told that the name of it is Cassuaries, I may then use that word to stand in discourse for all my complex idea mentioned in that description, though by that word, which is now become a specific name, I know no more of the real essence or constitution of that sort of animals than I did before, and knew probably as much of the nature of that species of birds before I learned the name, as many Englishmen do of swans or herons, which are specific names, very well known, of sorts of birds common in England. 35. Men determine the sorts of substances, which may be sorted variously. From what has been said, it is evident that men make sorts of things, for, it being different essences alone that make different species, it is plain that they who make those abstract ideas which are the nominal essences do thereby make the species, or sort. Should there be a body found, having all the other qualities of gold except malleableness, it would no doubt be made a question whether it were gold or not that is whether it were of that species. This could be determined only by that abstract idea to which every one annexed the name gold, so that it would be true gold to him, and belong to that species, who included not malleableness in his nominal essence, signified by the sound gold, and on the other side it would not be true gold, 
or of that species, to him who included malleableness in his specific idea, and who, I pray, is it that makes these diverse species, even under one and the same name, but men that make two different abstract ideas, consisting not exactly of the same collection of qualities. Nor is it a mere supposition to imagine that a body may exist wherein the other obvious qualities of gold may be without malleableness, since it is certain that gold itself will be sometimes so eager, as artists call it, that it will as little endure hammer as glass itself. What we have said of the putting in, or leaving out of malleableness, in the complex idea the name gold is by any one annexed to, may be said of its peculiar weight, fixedness, and several other the like qualities, for whatever is left out, or put in, it is still the complex idea to which that name is annexed that makes the species, and as any particular parcel of matter answers that idea, so the name of the sort belongs truly to it, and it is of that species, and thus anything is true gold, perfect metal, all which determination of the species, it is plain, depends on the understanding of man making this or that complex idea. 36. Nature makes the similitudes of substances. This, then, in short, is the case, nature makes many particular things, which do agree one with another in many sensible qualities, and probably too in their internal frame and constitution, but it is not this real essence that distinguishes them into species, it is men who, taking occasion from the qualities they find united in them, and wherein they observe often several individuals to agree, range them into sorts, in order to their naming, for the convenience of comprehensive signs, under which individuals, according to their conformity to this or that abstract idea, come to be ranked as under ensigns, so that this is of the blue, that the red regiment, this is a man, that a drill, and in this, I think, consists the whole business of genus and species. 37. The manner of sorting particular beings the work of fallible men, though nature makes things alike. I do not deny but nature, in the constant production of particular beings, makes them not always new and various, but very much alike and of kin one to another. But I think it nevertheless true, that the boundaries of the species, whereby men sort them, are made by men, since the essences of the species, distinguished by different names, are, as has been proved, of man's making, and seldom adequate to the internal nature of the things they are taken from. So that we may truly say, such a manner of sorting of things is the workmanship of men. 38. Each abstract idea, with a name to it, makes a nominal essence. One thing I doubt not but will seem very strange in this doctrine, which is, that from what has been said it will follow, that each abstract idea, with a name to it, makes a distinct species. But who can help it, if truth will have it so? For so it must remain till somebody can show us the species of things limited and distinguished by something else, and let us see that general terms signify not our abstract ideas, but something different from them. I would fain know why a shock and a hound are not as distinct species as a spaniel and an elephant. We have no other idea of the different essence of an elephant and a spaniel, than we have of the different essence of a shock and a hound, all the essential difference, whereby we know and distinguish them one from another, consisting only in the different collection of simple ideas to which we have given those different names. 39. How genera and species are related to naming. How much the making of species and genera is in order to general names, and how much general names are necessary, if not to the being, yet at least to the completing of a species, and making it pass for such, will appear, besides what has been said above concerning ice and water in a very familiar example, a silent and a striking watch are but one species, to those who have but one name for them, but he that has the name watch for one, and clock for the other, and distinct complex ideas to which those names belong, to him they are different species. It will be said perhaps, that the inward contrivance and constitution is different between these two, which the watchmaker has a clear idea of, and yet it is plain they are but one species to him, when he has but one name for them. For what is sufficient in the inward contrivance to make a new species? There are some watches that are made with four wheels, 
others with five, is this a specific difference to the workman? Some have strings and physics, and others none, some have the balance loose, and others regulated by a spiral spring, and others by hog's bristles. Are any or all of these enough to make a specific difference to the workman? that knows each of these and several other different contrivances in the internal constitutions of watches. It is certain each of these hath a real difference from the rest, but whether it be an essential, a specific difference or no, relates only to the complex idea to which the name watch is given, as long as they all agree in the idea which that name stands for, and that name does not as a generical name comprehend different species under it. They are not essentially nor specifically different. But if anyone will make minute divisions, from differences that he knows in the internal frame of watches, and to such precise complex ideas give names that shall prevail, they will then be new species, to them who have those ideas with names to them, and can by those differences distinguish watches into these several sorts, and then watch will be a generical name. But yet they would be no distinct species to men ignorant of clockwork and the inward contrivances of watches, who had no other idea but the outward shape and bulk, with the marking of the hours by the hand. For to them all those other names would be but synonymous terms for the same idea, and signify no more, nor no other thing but a watch. Just thus I think it is in natural things. Nobody will doubt that the wheels or springs, if I may so say, within, are different in a rational man and a changeling, no more than that there is a difference in the frame between a drill and a changeling. But whether one or both these differences be essential or specifical, is only to be known to us by their agreement or disagreement with the complex idea that the name man stands for, for by that alone can it be determined whether one, or both, or neither of those be a man. 40. Species of artificial things less confused than natural. From what has been before said, we may see the reason why, in the species of artificial things, there is generally less confusion and uncertainty than in natural, because an artificial thing being a production of man, which the artificer designed, and therefore well knows the idea of, the name of it is supposed to stand for no other idea, nor to import any other essence than what is certainly to be known, and easy enough to be apprehended. For the idea or essence of the several sorts of artificial things, consisting for the most part in nothing but the determinate figure of sensible parts, and sometimes motion depending thereon, which the artificer fashions in matter, such as he finds for his turn, it is not beyond the reach of our faculties to attain a certain idea thereof, and so settle the signification of the names whereby the species of artificial things are distinguished, with less doubt, obscurity, and equivocation than we can in things natural, whose differences and operations depend upon contrivances beyond the reach of our discoveries. 41. Artificial things of distinct species. I must be excused here if I think artificial things are of distinct species as well as natural since I find they are as plainly and orderly ranked into sorts, by different abstract ideas, with general names annexed to them, as distinct one from another as those of natural substances. For why should we not think a watch and pistol as distinct species one from another, as a horse and a dog, they being expressed in our minds by distinct ideas, and to others by distinct appellations? 42. Substances alone, of all our several sorts of ideas, have proper names. This is further to be observed concerning substances, that they alone of all our several sorts of ideas have particular or proper names, whereby one only particular thing is signified. Because in simple ideas, modes, and relations, it seldom happens that men have occasion to mention often this or that particular when it is absent. Besides, the greatest part of mixed modes, being actions which perish in their birth, are not capable of a lasting duration, as substances which are the actors, and wherein the simple ideas that make up the complex ideas designed by the name have a lasting union. 43. Difficult to lead another by words into the thoughts of things stripped of those abstract ideas we give them. I must beg pardon of my reader for having dwelt so long upon this subject, and perhaps with some obscurity, but I desire it may be considered how difficult it is to lead another by words into the thoughts of things, 
stripped of those specifical differences we give them, which things, if I name not, I say nothing, and if I do name them, I thereby rank them into some sort or other, and suggest to the mind the usual abstract idea of that species, and so cross my purpose, for, to talk of man, and to lay by, at the same time, the ordinary signification of the name man, which is our complex idea usually annexed to it, and bid the reader consider man, as he is in himself, and as he is really distinguished from others in his internal constitution, or real essence, that is, by something he knows not what, looks like trifling, and yet thus one must do who would speak of the supposed real essences and species of things, as thought to be made by nature, if it be but only to make it understood, that there is no such thing signified by the general names which substances are called by, but because it is difficult by known familiar names to do this, give me leave to endeavor by an example to make the different consideration the mind has of specific names and ideas a little more clear, and to show how the complex ideas of modes are referred sometimes to archetypes in the minds of other intelligent beings, or, which is the same to the signification annexed by others to their received names, and sometimes to no archetypes at all. Give me leave also to show how the mind always refers its ideas of substances, either to the substances themselves, or to the signification of their names, as to the archetypes, and also to make plain the nature of species or sorting of things, as apprehended and made use of by us, and of the essences belonging to those species which is perhaps of more moment to discover the extent and certainty of our knowledge than we at first imagine. 44. Instances of mixed modes names Kenny and Nyuf. Let us suppose Adam, in the state of a grown man, with a good understanding, but in a strange country, with all things new and unknown about him, and no other faculties to attain the knowledge of them but what one of this age has now. He observes Lamech more melancholy than usual, and imagines it to be from a suspicion he has of his wife Ada, whom he most ardently loved, that she had too much kindness for another man. Adam discourses these his thoughts to Eve, and desires her to take care that Ada commit not folly, and in these discourses with Eve he makes use of these two new words Kinney and Nyuf. In time, Adam's mistake appears, for he finds Lamech's trouble proceeded from having killed a man. But yet the two names Kinney and Nyuf, the one standing for suspicion in a husband of his wife's disloyalty to him, and the other for the act of committing disloyalty, lost not their distinct significations. It is plain then, that here were two distinct complex ideas of mixed modes, with names to them, two distinct species of actions essentially different. I ask wherein consisted the essences of these two distinct species of actions, and it is plain it consisted in a precise combination of simple ideas, different in one from the other. I ask, whether the complex idea in Adam's mind, which he called Kenny, were adequate or not, and it is plain it was, for it being a combination of simple ideas, which he, without any regard to any archetype, without respect to anything as a pattern, voluntarily put together abstracted, and gave the name Kinney to, to express in short to others, by that one sound, all the simple ideas contained and united in that complex one, it must necessarily follow that it was an adequate idea, his own choice having made that combination, it had all in it he intended it should, and so could not but be perfect, could not but be adequate, it being referred to no other archetype which it was supposed to represent. 45. These words, Kinney and Nyuf, by degrees grew into common use, and then the case was somewhat altered. Adam's children had the same faculties, and thereby the same power that he had, to make what complex ideas of mixed modes they pleased in their own minds, to abstract them, and make what sounds they pleased the signs of them but the use of names being to make our ideas within us known to others, that cannot be done, but when the same sign stands for the same idea in two who would communicate their thoughts and discourse together. Those, therefore, of Adam's children, that found these two words, Kinney and Nyuf, in familiar use, could not take them for insignificant sounds, but must needs conclude they stood for something, for certain ideas, abstract ideas, 
they being general names, which abstract ideas were the essences of the species distinguished by those names. If therefore, they would use these words as names of species already established and agreed on, they were obliged to conform the ideas in their minds, signified by these names, to the ideas that they stood for in other men's minds, as to their patterns and archetypes, and then indeed their ideas of these complex modes were liable to be inadequate, as being very apt, especially those that consisted of combinations of many simple ideas, not to be exactly conformable to the ideas in other men's minds, using the same names, though for this there be usually a remedy at hand, which is to ask the meaning of any word we understand not of him that uses it, it being as impossible to know certainly what the words jealousy and adultery, which I think answer, Hebrew, and, Hebrew, stand for in another man's mind, with whom I would discourse about them, as it was impossible, in the beginning of language, to know what Kini and Nyauf stood for in another man's mind, without explication they being voluntary signs in every one. 46. Instances of a species of substance named Zahab. Let us now also consider, after the same manner, the names of substances in their first application. One of Adam's children, roving in the mountains, lights on a glittering substance which pleases his eye. Home he carries it to Adam, who, upon consideration of it, finds it to be hard, to have a bright yellow color and an exceeding great weight, these perhaps, at first, are all the qualities he takes notice of in it, and abstracting this complex idea, consisting of a substance having that peculiar bright yellowness, and a weight very great in proportion to its bulk, he gives the names Ahab, to denominate and mark all substances that have these sensible qualities in them. It is evident now, that, in this case, Adam acts quite differently from what he did before informing those ideas of mixed modes to which he gave the names Kini and Nyauf, further he put ideas together only by his own imagination, not taken from the existence of anything, and to them he gave names to denominate all things that should happen to agree to those his abstract ideas, without considering whether any such thing did exist or not, the standard there was of his own making. But in the forming his idea of this new substance, he takes the quite contrary course, here he has a standard made by nature, and therefore, being to represent that to himself, by the idea he has of it, even when it is absent, he puts in no simple idea into his complex one, but what he has the perception of from the thing itself. He takes care that his idea be conformable to this archetype, and intends the name should stand for an idea so conformable. 47. This piece of matter, thus denominated Zahab by Adam, being quite different from any he had seen before, nobody, I think, will deny to be a distinct species, and to have its peculiar essence, and that the name Zahab is the mark of the species, and a name belonging to all things partaking in that essence. But here it is plain the essence Adam made the name Zahab stand for was nothing but a body hard, shining, yellow, and very heavy. But the inquisitive mind of man, not content with the knowledge of these, as I may say, superficial qualities, puts Adam upon further examination of this matter. He therefore knocks, and beats it with flints, to see what was discoverable in the inside. He finds it yield to blows, but not easily separate into pieces. He finds it will bend without breaking. Is not now ductility to be added to his former idea, and made part of the essence of the species that name Zahab stands for? Further trials discover fusibility and fixedness. Are not they also, by the same reason that any of the others were, to be put into the complex idea signified by the name Zahab? If not, what reason will there be shown more for the one than the other? If these must, then all the other properties, which any further trials shall discover in this matter, ought by the same reason to make a part of the ingredients of the complex idea which the name Zahab stands for, and so be the essence of the species marked by that name. Which properties, because they are endless, it is plain that the idea made after this fashion, by this archetype, will be always inadequate. 48. The abstract ideas of substance is always imperfect and therefore various. But this is not all. It would also follow that the names of substances would not only have, 
as in truth they have, but would also be supposed to have different significations, as used by different men which would very much cumber the use of language. For if every distinct quality that were discovered in any matter by anyone were supposed to make a necessary part of the complex idea signified by the common name given to it, it must follow, that men must suppose the same word to signify different things in different men, since they cannot doubt but different men may have discovered several qualities, in substances of the same denomination, which others know nothing of. 49. Therefore to fix the nominal species real essence supposed. To avoid this therefore, they have supposed a real essence belonging to every species, from which these properties all flow, and would have their name of the species stand for that. But they, not having any idea of that real essence in substances, and their words signifying nothing but the ideas they have, that which is done by this attempt is only to put the name or sound in the place instead of the thing having that real essence, without knowing what the real essence is, and this is that which men do when they speak of species of things, as supposing them made by nature, and distinguished by real essences. 50. Which supposition is of no use. For, let us consider, when we affirm that all gold is fixed, either it means that fixedness is a part of the definition, I e, part of the nominal essence the word gold stands for, and so this affirmation, all gold is fixed, contains nothing but the signification of the term gold, or else it means, that fixedness, not being a part of the definition of the gold, is a property of that substance itself, in which case it is plain that the word gold stands in the place of a substance having the real essence of a species of things made by nature, in which way of substitution it has so confused and uncertain a signification, that, though this proposition, gold is fixed, be in that sense an affirmation of something real, yet it is a truth will always fail us in its particular application, and so is of no real use or certainty. For let it be ever so true, that all gold, I, E, all that has the real essence of gold, is fixed, what serves this for, whilst we know not, in this sense, what is or is not gold, for if we know not the real essence of gold, it is impossible we should know what parcel of matter has that essence, and so whether it be true gold or number. 51. Conclusion. To conclude, what liberty Adam had at first to make any complex ideas of mixed modes by no other pattern but by his own thoughts, the same have all men ever since had, and the same necessity of conforming his ideas of substances to things without him, as to archetypes made by nature, that Adam was under, if he would not willfully impose upon himself, the same are all men ever since under too, the same liberty also that Adam had of affixing any new name to any idea, the same has any one still, especially the beginners of languages, if we can imagine any such, but only with this difference, that, in places where men in society have already established a language amongst them, the significations of words are very warily and sparingly to be altered, because men being furnished already with names for their ideas, and common news having appropriated known names to certain ideas, unaffected misapplication of them cannot but be very ridiculous. He that hath new notions will perhaps venture sometimes on the coining of new terms to express them, but men think it a boldness, and it is uncertain whether common news will ever make them pass for current, but in communication with others, it is necessary that we conform the ideas we make the vulgar words of any language stand for to their own proper significations, which I have explained at large already, or else to make known that new signification we apply them to.